Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Canterno. I am the account manager here in the Mid-Atlantic region, as well as the national account manager for all schools for the deaf nationwide. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to American Reading Company's first webinar exclusively for schools for the deaf. American Reed Company is an organization uh, founded and run by educators um, in the pursuit of love, literacy, and liberty. And our work is designed to give more to those who often receive less. More books, more writing, and more support. I, I want to thank you all for participating in this webinar today. I think I speak for everyone at American Reading Company when I say I'm absolutely blown away by today's turnout. As of the start of today's session, we are at over 220 educators registered from over 30 schools across the country, which is just absolutely amazing. So sincerely, thank you. Today's webinar will be accessible in both English and ASL. You may turn on the automated captioning if you wish. For an optimal experience, please set your view to the gallery. We will be recording today's session and hope to share it with all of you. You will receive an email in a few days with resources from the webinar that will include Dr. Cummins' presentation, as well as information about more upcoming events planned exclusively for Schools for the Deaf with American Reading Company. I encourage you to join the conversation through the chat feature We'd love to hear from you. In fact, right now, if you'd like to put in the chat where you may be joining us from, that would be wonderful. We'd love to say hello and welcome. And please make sure you change the drop down in the chat window from panelists to everyone. I want to thank a very special, sincere thank you to Gallaudet University, to Kindle Demonstration, to the Montclair National Deaf Education Center, all of the really hard work behind the scenes here, especially the production team of uh, Tyrone Giordano, Matthew Vita, Rainy Alem, and our interpreters for this afternoon, Tony Barraza and Diana Markle. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's panelists who will be leading us through our, our webinar. Uh, first will be Dr. Jim Cummins, who is a professor emeritus with the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto in Canada. His research focuses on literacy, development, educational context, characterized by linguistic and socioeconomic diversity. After Dr. Cummins' speech, we will be joined by Heidi Burns, who is a Senior Instructional Support Coordinator for a Kendall Demonstration here in Washington, D.C., as well as Tammy Murphy, who is the K-12 Project Manager for National Programs and Outreach here at the Clare Center. So without further ado, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Jim Cummins, I will come off screen, we will change interpreters, Diana will join us, and we hope you uh, enjoy today's webinar. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everybody. Um, let me just uh, express my appreciation for the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, it's great that so many of you have been able to uh, participate in the, uh, in the webinar. Uh, let me start by giving you a little bit more background about um, my own work and, and how I got involved uh, in issues related to the education of deaf and hard of hearing students. I'm not an insider in the area of deaf education. I got involved back in the late 1980s uh, in uh, Ontario, uh, Canada, where when I was approached by members of the deaf community uh, who were at that time pressuring a, a reluctant Ontario government to institute bilingual programs in the Ontario School for the Deaf. And uh, they discussed issues related to bilingual education with colleagues in the, in the US. And uh, they told me, hey, there's a guy just in your backyard who's uh, done some work on this. And that was me. Uh, a lot of the work I have done in the 1970s and 80s and 90s has concerned bilingual education. 
I haven't done work specifically relating to uh, the education of, of deaf and hard of hearing uh, students, except in terms of reviewing literature and trying to apply what we know from the research on bilingual education in general to uh, the education of um, uh, involving ASL and English uh, bilingual education. Uh, so in, in terms of the seminar, uh, the webinar today, I've divided my contribution up into four uh, different parts. First of all, I want to provide a general picture of issues related to achievement and underachievement uh, in American schools, Canadian schools, and schools around the world. Uh, because when we look at the challenges that uh, uh, deaf and hard of hearing students experience, it's useful to put those challenges into a broader uh, perspective in terms of what we know about precursors or causes of underachievement and what has been successful in relation to what schools can do to address those issues. Then the second part of what I'll talk about focuses on the need, the importance of providing a strong linguistic and conceptual background in the early years uh, for all students. And obviously uh, this happens through language for uh, a major part of the, uh, the population, except students who are uh, uh, profoundly deaf do not have that connection with their parents typically. And so the issues, uh, one of the major issues that we have to address is how can we provide a strong conceptual and linguistic foundation for students uh, in those early years, those crucial early years. The third part of what I'll talk about concerns bilingual education uh, more directly and the relationship between first and second languages. What we know from the vast amount of research that's been carried out on this issue across the globe, and then how does that apply to uh, ASL, English bilingual education? And then the last, last issue that I want to address is the fact that we've got to go beyond linguistic issues just to understand what's happening here. Issues related to identity and how identities are negotiated between teachers and students in schools is crucial. And we need to move from a deficit orientation in relation to the education of deaf and hard of hearing students to one that's acid-based. And this connects up with issues of power relations in the broader society. And I think we need to always keep that in mind because when we look at the education of deaf and hard of hearing students over the last 150 years, ever since 1880, and we've had a situation where uh, issues related to power uh, and status in the society have, been, have played a major role in terms of the miseducation of deaf students. So that's the, the broad outline of what I want to uh, talk about. And let me just go to the uh, the first uh, issue at this point in terms of like what causes academic achievement and what instructional responses are implied by these causal factors. And I want to share with you very briefly and, and sketchily <clears throat> a framework that I've used over the last few years for identifying evidence-based instructional responses. In other words, instructional responses that are supported by the research evidence. Uh, that can address what researchers have been calling opportunity gaps experienced by minoritized uh, students. And this, this framework starts off by uh, asking a very simple question, like who are the students that tend to experience uh, difficulty, who tend to experience underachievement uh, in our schools? And there are three broad categories of students that fall into, uh, uh, into this um, situation. First of all, we're looking at multilingual uh, stu students or multilingual English learners who are learning the school language as a second language. And obviously, uh, deaf students fall into that category because English is not a language uh, that most of them have acquired as a native language. A second group of students that tend to experience academic underachievement are students who are growing up in poverty, in low-income backgrounds, um, and who have um, uh, experienced various kinds of social disadvantage uh, and economic disadvantage uh, in their early years. Uh, and then the third category are students from socially marginalized groups that have been subject to, to racism and various forms of exclusion and discrimination from educational and social opportunity, often over generations. And again, if we look at the history of uh, the education of deaf and hard of hearing students, which 
probably everybody here is very familiar with, uh, we see a pattern of denial of uh, opportunities for students to gain a grounding, gain a conceptual foundation in a language that's accessible for them. Uh, and this is not based on any kind of research. This is based on prejudice. This is based on arrogance. And uh, this is a, an example of what I've called coercive relations of power. So when we look at, at these three groups and ask, well, you know, what are the evidence-based instructional responses that uh, can be um, brought it to bear in terms of, of mitigating or even reversing the, um, uh, the patterns of underachievement. So if we look at linguistically diverse students, students from low income, low socioeconomic backgrounds, and students who are from com communities that have been marginalized over many years, um, there we do have uh, a lot of research that points in the direction of how we can reverse these patterns of underachievement. And the first thing to note is that the students who tend to experience the most um, severe forms of under, uh, uh, underachievement are students who fall into all three of these categories. Students who are learning the school language as an additional language, students who are growing up in poverty, and students whose communities have been subject to uh, racism and marginalization uh, over long periods of time. And so we need to focus in not just on linguistic issues, we need to, uh, obviously, supporting students in gaining access uh, to a, a first language, a primary language like ASL and English. That's crucial. But we also need to address what we know about issues, uh, how we can push back on issues related to poverty and low income. Uh, and, and thirdly, uh, we need to address culturally responsive education um, initiatives and insights uh, that focus on reversing the marginalization that many uh, communities and families have experienced. So, um, for example, in terms of addressing linguistically diverse students, teachers, educators need to know how to scaffold comprehension and production of language across the curriculum. Uh, there's clear evidence that uh, they need to engage students' multilingual repertoire, all of the communication resources that students have at their disposal are relevant. And so the idea that you could, that you should only teach through the target language or teach um, bilingual, multilingual students only through English, that has been totally debunked by research over the last 30, 40 years. And then we need also to have a, a focus on demystifying how academic language works, how the language of books, how the language of literacy works. It's different from the language of everyday interpersonal communication in multiple ways. It's, it's, uh, has, it draws on a, a different vocabulary, uh, much more, many more low frequency words, discourse structures that are very different from what we do in face-to-face -face communication. And so those three things are important, scaffolding instruction, um, using visuals, for example, is, is one example of, of a scaffolding technique. Building on the multilingual resources that students bring to school and having a, a clear focus right throughout the curriculum on drawing students' attention to how language works. Um, obviously, all we could go into detail in all of those things, but I just want to give you a sketch right now of, of what this broad framework looks like. Uh, when we look at how we can push back on the negative effects of low socioeconomic status and poverty. There's not much that schools can do to uh, address issues related to overcrowding in houses. Uh, there's not much they can do to address segregation in communities which lead to segregated schools. But there is one thing uh, that we know is a crucial uh, precursor of strong literacy skills and on the other side of the coin, um, uh, underachievement in literacy. And that's addressing the fact that many students growing up in families uh, that are struggling economically and are coming from socially disadvantaged uh, areas and backgrounds, there's one thing that we can do. Most of these families do not have the money to buy books. The library resources, public library resources in their communities um, are often very meager. Uh, and so they grow up in a print uh, um, uh, sorry, in a, in a low print access uh, environment. 
And one of the things that we need to do uh, is to immerse students in a literacy rich uh, environment uh, to make up for the fact that they may not have had opportunities for this in their early years. And obviously this um, uh, may be exacerbated if students are, are coming from families where they have not had strong communication between uh, parents and students because of a, a language gap uh, there. So one thing that we know can work very well in mitigating the impact of, of low socioeconomic status is maximizing students' access to print and, in, and ensuring that they become engaged actively with literacy from the day they walk into school. And again, we need to reinforce uh, their knowledge of how academic language uh, works across the curriculum. And then when we look at students from marginalized uh, communities, uh, many of these communities, as we know, have experienced historically and are still experiencing various forms of societal discrimination that is often translated into low teacher expectations. There are stereotypes about particular communities and groups that, that lower teachers' expectations. And all of this adds up to a process of identity devaluation. And in the past, unfortunately, schools have reinforced that by focusing on what students may lack rather than the assets that they bring into the, into the school environment. And so when we look at what we need to do, we need to challenge, as educators, we need to challenge these patterns of coercive relations of power that students and their families uh, uh, may have experienced. This means connecting instruction to students' lives. It means challenging the colonial attitudes that many marginalized communities have experienced. Uh, it means valorizing the, uh, the varieties of language that they're bringing to school, their entire multilingual repertoire. And all of this adds up to a process and a mindset within the school uh, of affirming students' identities, and in particular, affirming their identities in association with literacy um, and academic engagement. So that's the, that's the big picture in terms of what, what schools need to do and what they can do uh, to push back on patterns of underachievement. And we can talk more about how um, deaf students uh, may fit into uh, that, uh, that broad framework. But I think there are clear ways in which uh, the experience of, of uh, deaf students uh, are uh, quite uh, interpretable within this, uh, this framework. Um, Okay, so the second part uh, that I want to focus on, and we can, I'll, I'll pause uh, after this, is just to um, reinforce something that everybody here knows. Um, and that's the crucial importance of language and literacy socialization in the early years. Um, some facts and issues about the early years. The preschool years represent a period where the neural architecture, the, the setup in our brains of the, our power to think, our power to work out problems, our power to, our power to live, all of this gets formed uh, uh, primarily in the first five years of life. Uh, about 90% of brain development occurs during this period. And the quality and quantity of this neural architecture growth is fueled by children's interactions with caregivers. And these interactions are mediated primarily through language. And one aspect of language interaction that is incredibly important in terms of future literacy development is the extent to which there is exposure to the language of print, the language of books. Children's shared book reading experiences exert lasting influences on their subsequent literacy development. And in recent years with um, uh, uh, neural imaging uh, techniques being available, uh, researchers have been able to see the growth of neural pathways that come about as a result of exposure to books. And so uh, it's not just language development in the narrow sense that we're talking about. It's also literacy development or pre-literacy development, literacy socialization that we need to, to focus in on. And, um, uh, and again, we can talk about uh, that some more, but there's a quote that I'd like to share with you from uh, Louisa Motes and, and a colleague um, uh, who summarized the 
uh, research uh, related to the benefits of reading aloud to children as, as follows. They say, reading aloud to a child is a critical activity in helping a child gain knowledge and build language skill that will enable good comprehension later on. Reading aloud increases background knowledge, builds vocabulary, and familiarize children with the language in books. Obviously, she's talking about reading aloud to hearing children, but signing uh, provides the same kind of, of input and conceptual development and vocabulary development associated with the, the content of books. And so a challenge, and again, this is um, uh, a major challenge because it's often uh, not focused on that much in the uh, early education of deaf and hard of hearing ch uh, uh, children is to how can we create contexts at an early stage in their lives where they're not only developing communication skills through ASL uh, and depending on the, on the child and the opportunities available in particular contexts, possibly through uh, 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 some residual hearing or through cochlear implants that some children may have, how can we ensure that there's a rich interaction going on linguistically, but also associated with the language of books? Um, and so Hall and Motes, uh, the re researchers that I quoted, point to research uh, that highlights the additional benefit of interactive story reading. Um, and uh, so the, by interactive story reading, reading, what they're talking about is reading an interaction between uh, parents and children um, that encourages active uh, listening, active interpretation and dialogue, and engages children in, in interaction about the story by means of open-ended questions. So it's not just children being in a passive role in relation to, to reading, it's interaction, it's expansion of what's in, in the story. Um, and when we look at the impact of this and the fact that many children from low-income backgrounds have much less access, much less of this kind of print socialization uh, than children from higher uh, income backgrounds. Uh, they have much less access because if families are struggling to put uh, food on the table, they probably don't have a lot of money to go out and buy books. But um, by the age of 17, students from low-income families exhibit a four-year lag. They're four years behind in their reading achievement uh, when compared to the reading achievement of students from more economically advantaged families. And clearly, uh, similar um, statistics uh, are, uh, have been at play in the education of, of deaf and hard of hearing students over, uh, uh, over the years. Um, so um, that's the second part that I want to, to highlight and emphasize. Um, the, the third part uh, concerns bilingual education and cross-linguistic uh, transfer. What do we know about the effects of ASL English bilingual education? Does it operate the same way as, um, uh, as with uh, uh, the languages, uh, spoken languages? Uh, are the same uh, factors uh, operating? Uh, if we have an ASL English bilingual program, does that mean that children are going to be uh, held back in their acquisition of English? All of these questions have been played out over the years, and there's been resistance to the setup or the establishment of uh, bilingual education programs in many contexts. Um, I mentioned the Ontario context and the struggle over many years that the deaf community uh, had to engage in to, um, uh, to gain bilingual education programs uh, in the Ontario School for the Deaf. Um, and it's still a struggle uh, in many contexts. So the reality is that um, students' knowledge of American Sign Language strongly facilitates their English development. Again, probably everybody here is, is very familiar with the fact that um, Deaf students from uh, deaf parents tend to do uh, better academically than deaf children from hearing parents for the simple reason that deaf children uh, growing up in a family where ASL 
is the language of communication, where there isn't a communication gap between parents and children, uh, are getting that conceptual development, that linguistic development in the early years. Um, and that provides them with a foundation that they can build knowledge of English on. Children who uh, are not getting that uh, uh, language and literacy socialization in the early years because their parents don't uh, uh, have competence in ASL or even in many cases signed English uh, are often experiencing a gap in communication that has neurological effects. And, um, and that puts uh, these children at a strong disadvantage in terms of sustained academic development over the years. Um, and so uh, I'll just quote you uh, a, um, uh, a little passage from uh, a major study that was done um, called Promoting the Educational Success of Children and Youth Learning English. Uh, this was um, a publication uh, by the uh, National um, uh, Academy um, of Science, Engineering and Medicine. It's a highly prestigious body. And they reviewed the research on bilingual education and uh, the achievement of uh, students who are learning English as an additional language. And um, they found that when students had a strong basis in their first language, that helped in terms of learning a second language. They also found that children in bilingual programs, for example, Spanish English bilingual programs, were doing at least as well uh, and frequently much, much better academically than children from similar backgrounds in all English programs. And they say in relation to uh, deaf children, they say, and this is a quote, studies of deaf children learning American Sign Language, uh, sorry, learning American Sign Language and English offer strongly compelling evidence that first language development facilitates second language development, illustrating the effect even across different modalities. Thus it appears that learning a language early establishes a general foundation that can be engaged for later language learning and literacy. And there's a large number of research studies that's been carried out over the last 20, 25 years that show exactly this pattern. Uh, adults and uh, individual students who have strong uh, knowledge of American Sign Language or another natural sign language in, in different countries, uh, tend to do much better in terms of English literacy than students whose American Sign Language is less well developed. Um, the, I've used a visual metaphor to talk about uh, these issues. I've, I've talked about the common underlying proficiency. Um, so that if you imagine an iceberg uh, and think of, of language proficiency as an iceberg where what you see above the surface it's only a small fraction of what's really important that's below the surface. As you know, the, the, the mass, the volume uh, of an iceberg that we don't see below the surface is much greater than what we see above the surface. But some linguists have, have suggested that we can use this as a, as a useful visual analogy for, um, uh, for thinking about language. That what we see above the surface, for example, somebody's fluency in a language um, or their dialect or their accent or whatever it might be, um, is only a small fraction of what's really going on linguistically, where uh, knowledge of vocabulary, knowledge of uh, less frequent functions of language are all things that, that matter academically. But if we take that visual uh, analogy for one language representing an iceberg, what the research, research is showing very clearly is that we can think of bilingualism as a double iceberg, where even though the surface features of each language are separate, they're distinguishable, obviously ASL and English are very distinguishable in all kinds of ways. Um, even though they're at a surface level, there's a, a lot of um, uh, uniqueness about uh, different languages. Uh, at, a, at a deeper level, at the level of conceptual development, uh, there's a lot of overlap or interdependence across languages. So that a student who has strong uh, literacy skills in one language can transfer those literacy skills to, um, to a second language. So in other words, what the research is saying about bilingual education is that ASL instruction in an ASL English bilingual program 
is not just developing ASL language skills. It's also developing a deeper conceptual and linguistic proficiency that's strongly related to the development of literacy in English. Um, so there's both conceptual and linguistic transfer between ASL and English. Uh, so cross-linguistic transfer might involve um, things like finger spelling and initialized si uh, signs. Um, and uh, we need to point out these connections to students in the, uh, in the classroom. So the last part that I want to um, uh, talk about, uh, it com comes down to what I started off with. The issues related to power and identity are critical. They're critical for all students um, because what we see, not just in, in the United States, but in Canada and in countries around the world, when we look at the experiences of minority students um, in many uh, countries, we see a process of exclusion. We see a process of racialization. Uh, we see a, a process of discrimination. Um, in some cases, incredibly brutal discrimination. For example, that indigenous um, uh, students have experienced uh, in many countries, including Canada and the United States. Um, so when we look at uh, what we, how we are, communicating with students and what the, the focus of our instruction is, if we're focused only on trying to remedy language problems that we perceive students as bringing into school, we may be communicating to, uh, to students that they're not very academically uh, promising, uh, that they have problems rather than assets. We may be addressing only a small portion of who the student is. And so we need, as I said before, we need to um, uh, connect our instruction, not just to what the student is bringing into the school, but what, this, what we want the student to be able to do. And this, uh, so in other words, part of, of what we need to do in terms of implementing culturally responsive uh, instruction and pushing back against the historical pattern of coercive relations of power uh, is to ask ourselves, What's the image of the student that we're sketching in our instruction? And so the, the kind of questions that we could ask ourselves as we look either individually or collectively at our own instruction, to what extent is the student getting the message that he or she is capable of becoming bilingual and biliterate? Um, to what extent are they getting a mess the message that they're capable of higher order thinking and intellectual accomplishments? Well, if we look at our instruction, uh, in our school, and if there is very little intellectually challenging work that students are being asked to do or given opportunities to do, they're not getting that message. To what extent are students getting the message that they're capable of creative and imaginative thinking, capable of creating literature and art, capable of generating new knowledge, capable of thinking about and finding solutions to social issues. All of these are uh, ways in which we're negotiating identities with students. And so the danger in uh, working with uh, uh, students who are learning English as an additional language, whether they're coming from, uh, whether they're experiencing deafness or hard of hearing issues, or uh, just uh, learning English uh, with a, a different language in the, in the home uh, context, the danger is that we focus only on the problems that they're having right now in acquiring the language of schooling. And we don't focus on the broader meaning of education, which involves all of those things that I talked about. So one thing that I think we need to talk about in our school communities is to what extent are we communicating to students that they're capable of intellectual accomplishments, that they're capable of critical thinking, that they're capable of using language in creative ways. And um, I'll stop uh, there and uh, just leave those questions uh, with you. And I look forward to um, uh, talking more about some of these issues in the Q&A later on this afternoon. So thank you. I, I did have one question from the, the audi uh, an audience member that wanted to see if they could get more information <clears throat> on the quote that you had 
uh, cited from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine about the uh, compelling evidence that first language development facilitates second language development. I don't know if you could repeat that for uh, the participants today. Okay, the, um, uh, that report is a, is a large scale uh, report. There's, I think about 600 pages in it. It, it addresses a lot of uh, issues related to education of bilingual students and students who are learning English as an additional language. And they, uh, it was put together by a committee of about 30 people um, and reviewed by uh, several uh, researchers in, in the field. So the results are extremely credible. And so their review of the um, effects of bilingual education uh, showed, and I can share quotations uh, related to this, uh, showed that students who, are ex who experience a bilingual education uh, where there's a focus on developing uh, language skills and literacy skills in two languages. Um, over time, by the time they get to the end of elementary school, uh, they're doing at least as well and frequently significantly better than students from similar backgrounds who've been educated only through English, where their first language has not been um, part of their educational experience. Um, so that, that's basically the, the conclusion that they come to. And they also highlight the fact uh, that we do have a common underlying proficiency uh, that allows for transfer across languages. So um, I, again, I'd be happy to share um, additional information about that particular report and, um, uh, and its implications. Thank you, Dr. Cummings, very much. At this point, we're going to switch uh, interpreters and then it is my honor to bring up Heidi Burns. Uh, who is again the senior instructional support coordinator for Kendall demonstration here in DC, as well as Tammy Murphy, who is the K-12 project manager for the national programs and outreach here at the Clara Center. So we're gonna switch interpreters. Thank you again, and excited to have Tammy and Heidi with us. Dr. Cummings will be joining us for the Q&A portion at the conclusion of Tammy and Heidi's speech. So first off, I have to say just hello. I'm actually a little bit overwhelmed to see so many people in attendance today and look at everyone's name. There are definitely names out there I recognize. I see a former mentor in the field of bilingual education out there. So it's exciting. It's exciting to see that everybody's here. And it makes me realize that our community is large. Sometimes it feels small when we go to work every day, but really it's not. We are a large community. And so finding a time and a place to come together and dialogue is amazing. And I'm so excited to be here today to join this large community and conversations for all of us. Um, so definitely looking forward to that. Now, one of my favorite conversation partners is here with me on the screen and that's Tammy Murphy. Hello. Hi, Tammy. You know, this is what we talk about daily. We pass each other in the hall and we're in a conversation so quickly. Um, and I mentioned to Tammy that here at Kendall, our journey with the American Reading Company, ARC, back in October and the conversations that we've had in terms of literacy, reading and writing and ASL, it's just been exciting. And now we're getting to do with other schools that are on the same type of journey as we are. So Tammy and I, um, we had this conversation a while ago. Didn't we start it back then, Tammy? We did. I remember we were working at the Fremont School for the Deaf, and I happened to be living out there, and I had a side job. So I worked with Heidi uh, on a play called, what was it called, Chocolate and Chocolate Factory? It was the Willy Wonka oh, and that's Chocolate right. Factory. That's, that's what it was. And I remember that I was working as a translator going from the English script for the Oompa Loompa characters and translating them into ASL for that play. And that was the beginning of our relationship. And we've been, you know, every conversation we have always goes back to language, uh, even now. So great and exciting. And so now we have everyone else here joining us in this conversation. And we're looking forward to your thoughts from today, your, your questions, 
some of the things that you want to highlight. It, really, we're here for a conversation. Now, it does feel a little strange that we don't see the 100 plus people that are out there. We only see ourselves, but we know you're there. And Dr. Cummings presented about his work and the four categories and looking at the connections with the daily work that we face. Now, I've been involved with deaf education for how many years? I think I'm now in my 23rd year working in education and we're continually, we have a passion and we have a craving for conversations about this, language access, bilingualism, and seeing how we can improve the situation for all of our students. So that's how I'm beginning my thoughts today. So I used to work as a teacher in Ontario, Canada, and then here as well at Kendall. I'm now uh, doing the outreach program, going to different uh, schools for the deaf across the country, training people about bilingualism and linguistic education. And when I used to teach, I used uh, different reading programs, and I really felt that they weren't really designed for deaf and hard of hearing students. They just weren't. And I brought it up to ARC. Uh, and now I'm curious uh, with ARC. I haven't had much experience yet, but is there anything in art that really fits in with deaf and hard of hearing education? Because we haven't had anything. So what are your thoughts? Not specifically. So it's not designed for deaf and hear hard of hearing students, but it's designed for multilingual frequency and resources. And what I see is the value looking at what students bring. So looking at students' experiences from home, looking at their home language, looking at all the resources, the wealth that they come with. And that's a focus. So for me, when we look at ASL in English and bilingual education, it's not that difficult to see the connection and make that transition. It doesn't feel forced, it doesn't feel forced in terms of reading, writing, and math. There's not been a lot designed specifically for our community. Now, I know many people are expertise, those of you in the community out there, and you might look at curriculums and try to see best how it fits. So we can do that with this as well. And I think it's gonna be an ongoing process for all of it, us, no matter what curriculum we use. And as Dr. Cummings mentioned, it's that mindset. It's bringing the approach and looking at the students that we can find some commonalities in terms of what we're going to use, looking at the value for their home experiences, the value that they bring, how they're playing and modulating and working with different languages, especially now, even though I'm not technically in the classroom teaching anymore, I am a school lead and I'm a manager. I do go back to the classroom occasionally. I know many of you are doing that now in schools as we have a teacher shortage out there. So even though I'm not full-time teacher, I am back in the classroom and I'm excited to learn more from the new generation of teachers because things have changed from when I was in the classroom, that's pre-pandemic. And even now we can see what new teachers are bringing, new knowledge, new wisdom, new ideas. And I think we can embrace all of this and try to incorporate it in our teaching. So I think it's an opportunity for us to use this and bring all of this value together. You know, I was uh, just thinking uh, with ARC, all of their stuff is in English and transitioning that over. I have to look at the individual child and see what their background is, what their profile looks like. And typically what we see out there is that, you know, students show up without any language because they don't have any communication at home. And I feel like, you know, saying that they don't have any language, you know, that's it. They can't grow. That's not true. You know, they haven't been exposed to ASL. Maybe they didn't have any experience with English, but they have something and they've survived at home. So uh, I can give you an example of what I mean. In Canada, I was a kindergarten teacher and a second grade teacher had a brand new student that showed up in the middle of the year and they had gone to various foster homes and they didn't have any access to American Sign Language and English. And they were like, oh, that's it. And I was like, no, 
I mean, it's not that we can identify it right away, but if we socialize them with different individuals, maybe someone will see something that they see. And sure enough, there was a individual who noticed um, a pattern with them, their body language, how they moved, different things or different behaviors that they exhibited. Um, you know, we made that into a bit of a game. And sure enough, we found out that uh, it was a game and once we made a connection they knew that there was a connection to this game and that was able to scaffold into new language later and i think it's important that we don't just decide that that child doesn't have any asl or english but that we look deeper and we socialize them with different people with different perspectives maybe from different backgrounds different cultures uh and look at that child deeper. And then once we identify that connection, build ASL from that or whatever their preferred language is to scaffold that into a language acquisition for them. And that we don't just limit them by saying that they don't have any language. Yeah, I feel as a teacher and a school administrator that I'm constantly you know, looking at myself and asking myself questions about the students and making sure that when new students come, am I making an assumption about them or am I just putting a judgment on them that I don't even recognize? I need to look at the value of what each student has because students come in with a lot. They each have value and each of us are humans and we know we bring different skills. And as that teacher administrator, I can overlook that at times, especially now as I'm getting older. So it's harder for me to recognize some of these things that are showing up in the younger generation. And yet I think that's where collaboration is so important for me to do with other teachers, for all of us to do together, gain from what the various students' experiences are, and I need to be exposed to this various viewpoints and perspectives, and I recognize that as well. So if students show up, I can absolutely overlook a strength that they might have, and that's overlooking an opportunity as well. There would be a chance or an opportunity to connect and I could overlook that. And these are, we're talking about multilingual, multimodal, you know, what's all underneath what we were talking about, that iceberg, what's below. So we have to look for that. We have to constantly be on the search. And it's not easy. And now that I'm more in a lead position, I think I need to be extremely mindful about that in providing more time for our teachers to have chance for these conversations to be able to discuss this and collaborate for each different student. There are challenges. It's challenging for me as well because we don't want to just operate on assumptions. I agree. And, you know, teachers, you know, do they have enough resources? Typically, all the resources we have are English-based, and we need to expand that. And I do know that there are some people out there who have developed their resources, but there's been no collaboration on those resources. And typically in our classroom, you know, we have English-based resources. So I, you know, I feel bad for those teachers who are investing their time interacting with students and developing something that works for their students specifically. So um, when Dr. Cummings mentioned about the home, you know, uh, age birth to five being so important, I keep thinking about how we need more visual ASL videos, more socializing, and not just print. Uh, and there's, you're right, individuals who can't afford to buy uh, books, iPads, technology, and there's many things that we have to take into consideration. The teacher's time developing all the resources, the opportunities for access to ASL resources is just very scarce at this point. And I think that's why this type of webinar or where we can come together in one place, we something that we can share. Um, we can increase our resources together. There's never one way to do something, but through collaboration, we can learn from each other. And I'm looking at, you know, the things that are the names of people in the chat, people that I've met through ARC. Um, I've had brief conversations with people across the states. And even in a 15, 20 minute conversation with someone, it just energizes me to continue. I get inspired by talking with others doing this work and we can expand um, our PLC, professional learning community in these conversations because we learn from each other and we can learn at a distance now, which is great. We got that, that benefit from Zoom and during the pandemic, 
collaboration all of a sudden just got larger. And so <laughs> I'm so fired up, ready to jump in and do this with colleagues out there, right? We can do this nationwide. Um, and Tammy, it's wonderful now where we have our bilingual program, even thinking about the visuals we could use, the charts and things like that. We have those for our writing workshop in English, but we don't have anything for sign language. I haven't done those visuals. So even in this, right, think about what we need to do to create new visuals and make sure those are bilingual as well. Uh, you were also mentioning the work writing workshops, and I wanted to throw out there that um, the framework uh, of literacy, literacy being reading and writing, but it's also visual. We always talk about it being reading and writing, but it's also expressive uh, ASL or uh, receptive ASL, right? We always do guided reading, uh, guided re independent reading, shared reading. But where is the ASL? reading, whereas the guided receptive ASL reading, it is their first language, most of their first language or their preferred language. So there should be options. And I know we have some students who come in with a strong English background or spoken English background or preference to it. And we should have a class that has a writing workshop and another class that has a signing workshop. But I think if we start with the signing workshops, and uh, guided uh, receptive signing, like um, Dr. Cummings mentioned that, you know, cognitive level, what it could look like. You know, like if we did a signing workshop uh, and we had to do a signed essay, not so much a written essay, but a signed essay and show what it looks like where you have your title, your uh, paragraphs, your conclusion, not in English, just do it in ASL, explaining what an essay looks like and the parts of an essay, introduce the three portions of it. Uh, you're already chunking and then the closing, what that looks like. And once they understand that concept, they can transition that learning and apply it to written English. So when you get to the written English part, you'd say, remember when you put your hands down, that's a period. When you did this, that's how we chunked it they'd already have that knowledge from the ASL uh, workshops, but that concept is hard to develop in English. You know, uh, whatever you do for that child, if it's a spoken child, sure, let them do the English version. But if it's a ASL preferred child, you know, I think we should start in that uh, type of a classroom. Ideally, a classroom would value both languages equally and use both. And speaking from experience, and we know it's a challenge um, because to hold all of that expertise, right? If I have the expertise, maybe I have it in both languages. Now we're talking about two different modalities and there's the input and there's the output. So we have to think about relying. I know I rely heavily on the people that I work with through conversations about all of this, but it also has me think about for students who come, heavily with spoken language. We have students like that, spoken English, or they're just acquiring American Sign Language when they come into the school. They might not have full access to that spoken language at home. They may or may not. And so I think about how I'm gonna communicate with them, how I can give some motivation for them to be learning ASL. And I've seen some students, some hard of hearing students who have a great deal of spoken language ability and they gather together, they'll find each other in the school. And what we've done is we can also allow them to understand ASL is their language as well. And there's other ways to use English. And even with native signers, how can we show them that there's a need for this in their life and they'll have both. So in bilingual instruction, how we set up, if I can make it very clear that there's an ASL workshop and a English workshop, then there's a value for both. And I would want to get both. So showing that to our students, especially now in middle school, we have spoken English curriculum, or we have Spanish as a first language for some. We have some students who come to school, come to school where they might be speaking English Spanish. or speaking Spanish at home, but they're learning American Sign Language and English in the school. And we have to figure out 
how they can even keep that original first language they have at home. So as a deaf person, we're adding languages. And I look at this as a fluid evolution for them. The more I trust the individual student in the process, the more I can see these languages evolving and emerging. And we're working on, you know, the famous five paragraph essay that you just mentioned, something like that. In middle school, we start teaching that. And I did talk about that. I talked about, you'll have three points. And one student went like this to me. And he used a classifier and put that right there onto the paper. That for me was such an incredible ex example of seeing something visually presented in ASL and then applying that into what we were learning there. It was a great example. And I think we're giving opportunities to the student to continually be fluid and move through these different languages and figuring out that we're the ones facilitating it, but they have things. It's less stress for them. It's less stress that I have to be the expert in it. It's more I'm there to guide them and facilitate their use and multi-language use there. You know, I remember we had that um, conversation about translanguaging, uh, how we have English on one side and ASL on the other side. But it's not limited to just one language. Like if you're on a computer sitting with a student, and I did this actually in your classroom one time, you had a uh, SLP, a speech language pathologist, working with one of your students. And I was watching, uh, they were watching a play and I looked over and I saw the SLP do a perfect example of it. They did this and they said, translingual, what is it, language, is it, uh, languaging. Um, they read through the English text and then they moved their hand and they said, okay, now we're going to sign it. Is this what they said? And they were having a discussion about the English text in ASL. And then they you know, went back to English. So it was two languages happening. And it wasn't at the same time. It was done consecutively uh, back and forth. And I think that was way more fluid. And we should allow that to happen more often, uh, whatever would work for that child. Yes. And the challenge sometimes is to allow it to happen that way. You know, it actually means giving up some of the control. As anyone is translanguaging, things will happen. And as a teacher, I know that I like to have control. <laughs> I admit that. And I have to figure out where I can let go of that. I know one student who was working on a actual written English dialogue. And I saw the student actually sitting at the desk writing, but using their knowledge of ASL, body shifting. And the body would move to one side. Oh, okay, this is who's talking now. And then the other person. So I saw that student using their ASL language skill to actually help them in writing. And I might've just jumped in and just looked at the finished project, which was the English, but I realized, no, let that student go through it. What a great strategy they were using to figure this out. They were actually engaged in some ASL, some grant, grammatical part of that. And that's something we can highlight using both languages to get something clear for the student and to learn. And when we recognize it, we recognize that the value that they're bringing, and giving these students an opportunity. You know, languages are never 100% distinct. There is a relationship between them and an individual, and it's ongoing and it's fluid. Uh in terms of relationships between ASL and sign, uh, this, this happens for me too. Um, when I teach, I notice that I make a lesson plan and uh, in the lesson plan, I do a lot of work in ASL and then the academic part in English. And that's where I came to understand after talking with several other teachers, uh, there was someone from Berkeley University that came one time to practice uh, ASL poetry and ASL comprehension, English comprehension, written at uh, Boston University, rather, uh, that they did that PLC. It's the power of PLC. Um, we did all four, uh, and we did it in a challenge. So it was a teacher's classroom, became uh, ASL class uh, comprehension, Another classroom became poetry, 
English comprehension and then uh, English poetry, and we cleared it up. Uh, we made it clear for the students that in this room they did sign, in this room they did writing, in another room it was receptive, and another room was was also receptive. And uh, the teacher should be able to do all four of those things to help their students become fluid in both languages. Uh, we didn't finish that experiment, but we did see progress in the students being able to see the difference between the two languages. And you can work with the two languages in an activity and just go back and forth between them. And there are relationships between the two languages. All right, I didn't realize, I think I'm checking. Um, I wanna be mindful of the time. So maybe last thoughts, cause it did go by quickly. <laughs> I actually took some notes, Dr. Cummings' presentation, and I admit um, there were notes for myself and also notes for our talk today. Is there anything you want to add, Tammy? Yeah, I was going to say that. Th I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Dr. Cummings, hold on. Wait for an interpreter to come up. Now, Andy, is this the time now for... We should answer some of the question and answers that we've seen in the chat. We have a, a question about how the cultural change of reading and the importance of the immersion in text, because that was something that Dr. Cummings had spoke about earlier as well. Would you be able to speak to that? Yes, I can speak from my experience here at Kendall. So when I talked about looking at the the students being able to actually own the English text. So right now I'm working with older students, but this can be the same with younger students. They're very enthusiastic to say they can do it and they're motivated often. But by the time they get to middle school, they've had experiences that have deterred them from connecting with English. And they don't feel as if they actually own the ability to communicate in written English as much sometimes or to do what the teachers ask. Now, the students are very willing to read and they're willing to actually write, but there's something about the idea of ownership. They actually own this other language and I don't see it as much for them. And so we're starting to see a shift in that actually now. And I think probably this is because of what the Kendall teachers are doing. They're giving time to the students. They're giving them time and place to actually use text in different mediums for different purposes. And I think if we're consistent with that and we continue to do that, our students will learn this. Like reading, you're reading for you. You're not reading for me, the teacher. You're actually reading for you. And what is it that you wanna do with any type of printed text? Letting them know that we can find the materials you want. We can bring in books that you want. We can um, help you in this way. Or I know this great video to watch or something as opposed to the students don't know what to choose. So it's a collaborative process that we work with and it's that immersion into text. I know many of us have the DEAR, the drop everything and read. We had gone through that program and as a teacher, I used to do that, but I was also frustrated because I didn't feel as if the students were getting what they needed from that activity. I noticed often students would be sitting there just like fumbling through the pages but they weren't actually maybe reading. And I wondered what was going on. And in that experience, you know, there was a specific time. We checked it off. They did the reading. But I've noticed a shift from that where reading doesn't have to be a quiet experience anymore. Reading can actually be, they're immersive in something. It can be a collaborative. It can actually be loud <laughs> at times. It's that students might be exploring something. They might be sitting together with a teacher. Um, mentoring or facilitating something that they're reading. And in a conference, I might say, oh, okay, I see this and there's a particular skill you have. And then point out to something that they're reading or I give them something to read and use that in a conference. So it's having them own that use of the language. I've actually seen fear start to mitigate in general in our students. They're braver. They're showing a passion more for it. And it's through sharing books with them. And I've seen more excitement. 
it's exciting for all of us. I think it's the best part of teaching when you see your students engaging or they come up and they want to share something with you or what they're doing and they're really engaged in something that is very exciting. And we're still working, you know, where we can put that same amount of immersion and have materials and content in ASL. ASL is not just the language of instruction. That's often what it is. There's, you know, there's more that's under the iceberg. There's more of it. Where else can we bring that in? And I think we need more collaboration to develop all that. We need to be working on that and building that in intentionally as we do with our strong shared reading programs. And the ARC can provide a lot of the reading and that's wonderful, but we can bring in more of the SL materials and resources, I think. Uh, if I could also add to that, um, there has been a cultural change in reading as well in two ways. Students, uh, like Heidi said, are less afraid of reading before their fear of reading was that they had no connection with English. And so what we're doing now is uh, we're providing, you know, curriculum of figure spelling related to reading and um, patterns of figure spelling through decoding uh, and patterns through finger spelling, reading and decoding. In finger spelling, it's uh, related to the reading, the decoding ability, uh, giving them tools to decode when they read. Uh, for example, if a sentence says, the boy sat on the uh, bed, they would show a sad boy sitting on the bed, but they already had, you know, sad, had, uh, they sat, had all these words. Uh, so when they read, they're able to quickly read through it. Um, but they'd already see the boy looking sad on the on the bed, and then they would finger spell that word. And they'd go, oh, that just means sat, because they already incorporated the finger spelling into that. So they were able to self-correct. So that uh, becomes more empowering for them. Uh, the more uh, curriculum we have in ASL regarding um, ASL or finger spelling, uh, I think that'll reduce their fear to reading, uh, being bilingual. The other change I see too is uh, in regards to social media. There's a lot more visual uh, social media posts with text on them so they can read and see what's going on. In the past, we didn't have that. Everything was done in just print, but now things are very visual. Videos, signing, they have uh, words pop up on the video. So it's uh, becoming a place where they can access both. And access to signers. Um, we know some of our students who know other deaf people their same age, but they're across the country. And of course, they're seeing each other on TikTok and types of social media like that. And so it's really cool um, when I talk about TikTok with my middle schoolers, it's a resource for them. And we have to figure out how we can tap into this, their use of this type of various apps where there's different models, language models out there. Can I just um, add something? One of the things that came up in, in your conversation, uh, Heidi and, and Tammy, is uh, the fact that um, in, in, in a lot of cases, the children themselves are bringing the two languages into, into contact. And this, this marks a, a big change from uh, the traditional orientation to bilingual education, where the, it was almost a dogma that you kept the two languages separate uh, because there was concern that, okay, if the two languages are mixed in the, in the classroom, children are going to get confused and they're never going to get each language in some kind of a pure form. That, that uh, belief uh, has changed dramatically over the last 10 years or so. And it's partly related to uh, the notion of translanguaging, uh, which basically means that uh, we try to enable students to make full use of their entire multilingual repertoire and, that, and multilingual in a broad sense. Uh, we have the, the, the uh, line between technology and language is changing. New technologies are bringing new opportunities. Uh, so there's all kinds of potential resources that students themselves are exploring. And so I think it's, it's important that students have access to 
uh, ASL literacy. It's important that they have access to English literacy, but it's equally important that we provide opportunities for the, the uh, students to bring their two languages into productive contact. Um, and so I think loosening up and, and getting ourselves free from dogmas that are no longer relevant or useful is, um, I think, something that uh, is is kind of is energizing, not just in, in the context of ASL and, and English, but in terms of bilingual programs generally. And so one, one of the um, uh, strategies that some teachers have used uh, all in ASL as well as in um, uh, other languages is to have students create dual language books uh, where they might uh, say a student might write a book initially in say we're talking about hearing students might write a book initially in, in Spanish or whatever their first language might be. Uh, and then they translate it and maybe work with the teacher or work with other students to translate it uh, into English. And then they publish these dual language books say, on the school website. Um, and they're showcasing their, um, uh, th their growing knowledge of two languages. Uh, and uh, uh, a former student uh, uh, who's now fairly well-known academic, Dr. Kristen Snodden, uh, looked at, at this um, in uh, ASL also, and students creating ASL and uh, English uh, uh, books. And so that's an example of bringing the two languages into productive contact, where the students are showcasing what they can do in each language, uh, and it provides an opportunity for teachers to provide the support to enable them to do that. And that's, I think that goes back to what Heidi was saying about taking ownership of the language, because when those dual language books or whatever, whatever kind of project it might be, when they're done in both languages or in multiple languages, for example, if we take the student who might have Spanish as a home language, and then they're, they've got ASL and, and they're learning English, we do it in all three of those languages, uh, then um, what they produce holds a mirror up to them in which they can see their identities being reflected back in a positive light, and that's empowering. And so it's the students develop a, a sense of competence and confidence that fuels further engagement. So I think getting away from the notion that we need to keep the two languages separate and looking for ways in which we can enable students to, to use all of the growing power that they have uh, in expressing themselves with multiple resources, I think is something that uh, can be very empowering for us as teachers too. This is Andy. We did have a question um, for Friday from the chat. Uh, Shiana wanted to know if you're seeing positive changes as a result of the teacher's approach with the students or because of ARC. Well, we're still in the infancy of using the ARC here. We started our collaboration. I believe September or October, and we've been using what they're calling the independent reading level assessment. And so students do some reading. We meet then as a teacher conference. We give them other things in terms of practice. Then we meet again. And there's been a shift just in terms of how I've learned to teach reading and guided reading. So I've learned that. I'm working with students and I'm giving them the materials, the books, and I, I'm going through a lot of it. And so for me, what I've learned, it's a challenge. It's been a challenge for our teachers, but everybody seems to be embracing it. And I sit with the teachers at first, and then I'm allowing them and the student to go practice the skill on their own without the instructor there with them. So the student goes and practices and then comes back with the teacher. And if we're measuring the enthusiasm of the student, we've seen a progress in that already. Um, so we've seen that happen. But again, it all goes back to the students gaining that ownership of English and text. Often in schools, um, we just had a MAP test, the MAP test. And before the test, I talked with everything we've been doing will apply to this type of MAP test. It's just reading. You know, don't be concerned about it. It's everything we've been doing. And I've noticed that the students' acceptance and attitude, like they sit up, ready to go, eager in their chairs. And so we're seeing that. We are definitely seeing a positive impact, even though we haven't fully 
taken on the ARC. It's still a work in progress. We're learning, we're learning about it ourselves. We're learning what levels are gonna work with our students. Um, there's a lot of technical parts that we have to learn, but it's shifting the philosophy here in the school. It's shifted me. I see how it's changed me. How I'm reading with the students is different because before I kept the languages very distinct from each other. I would say this is in ASL and this is English, this is ASL time or English time, but now we're bringing the languages together. There's more flexibility and I'm just allowing it to happen. It's much more of an organic process and we're using the two languages together with the individual students because each and every one of them determine, it's a negotiation with the students, how much of either language. I hope I'm answering you. Um, I looked at the actual text here for the question. So I hope I hit on what it was that you were asking. I think yes, that it's related to use of the ARC. Absolutely, conversations and trainings that we've had about reading, I would see a cultural shift happen in our school. This is Andy. I also wanted to just mention uh, something that you had talked about as well, you and Tammy, is I've been amazed by the power of the PLCs internally and the amount of work that has gone in from all the schools collaborating. We do not have an ASL specific curriculum, but we're working on ways to modify. Um, and a lot of that comes with the work that we do with the schools and with each other, which has been really nice. We've learned so much. The more we learn, the more we know what we need to go back and do to kind of help the children to gain that, uh, that understanding of both ASL and the English. So there's been a lot of powerful PLCs that we're working on and we're going to continue to do in the future with more schools as, as the onboarding has become. So it's been a really amazing process. Um, Dr. Cummings, we're, as we're running up on time, did you have any final words that you wanted to share uh, today uh, with, with all the panelists and the registrants? Um, just uh, to say uh, thank you to Heidi and to Tammy, because uh, I've learned a lot from your conversation with each other, uh, and also to our uh, two interpreters uh, who have um, uh, probably struggled to make sense of, of some of what uh, we've been saying, but I appreciate the the effort. Um, and but I think a lot of a lot of what we're talking about here comes back to first principles. Uh, we need to connect instruction with students' lives. Um, uh, why would they engage with something that has no real meaning for them? And that means getting to know our students. And, and as Tammy pointed out, students are coming in with a wide range of linguistic skills, experiences, et cetera. So there's no kind of off the shelf rule book that you can uh, pull down and say, okay, here's what you do in this situation. Uh, it comes down to the creativity of, of teachers. And, um, and so I think that's why the, the work with ARC is uh, uh, probably really useful because as far as I know, this is the first time a reading company has really sat down with uh, educators of deaf students and saying, look, what do we need to know to make our reading materials um, effective and relevant for the context that you're in? And they're learning a lot, you're learning a lot, and uh, certainly I've learned a lot from, from this whole conversation. This is Andy. I want to just personally say thank you again, Dr. Cummings, um, Heidi Burns. Heidi's amazing. I've been working with Heidi for, for a few months now. I feel like I've been working with her, which is absolutely wonderful. It's been wonderful getting to know Tammy. She has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we can get you our contact information. I also wanted to just let everyone know that um, we will be also hosting what's called a scene is believing. It'll be uh, hosted by the wonderful staff of the Delaware School for the Deaf, and that's going to be taking place on the 28th of March. And it'll be an opportunity to see pieces of the American Reading Company core instruction virtually and then participate in a QA with the staff, which would be which should be a lot of fun and another good way to kind of see some of the things that we've talked about today in action. And then uh, I will be also attending this year's CEASD conference out in California for the second year in a row. So if you are out there, I would love to say hello and uh, so please stop by and say hi. But we will be sending the slides uh, that Dr. Cummings had planned. We'll also be sending the uh, link out for the recorded version of this so you can share this with whoever else may benefit from it. And again, a million thank yous to everyone here at Gaudet, Kendall, and uh, Wakarsa. It's been absolutely wonderful. So we cannot thank you enough.
enjoy the rest of your week and um, have a great day. So thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you.